Welcome to Learning English from the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Today on the show, you'll hear reports from Ashley Thompson, Jonathan Evans, Susan Shand, and me. We'll close the show with our American history program, The Making of a Nation. But first, here's Susan Shand. Diversity is making uneven progress in leadership positions of American business. Women increasingly are getting positions on boards of companies. Members of racial and ethnic minorities, however, are still rarely appointed to boards. 27% of new company directors in the Russell 3000 index were women during 2016 to 2018. That is up from 21% in the three years before, says ISS Analytics, in an examination for Reuters. In 2018 alone, the percentage was 32 for women. Though women still are underrepresented, their gains have been larger than those of African Americans and Latinos. Blacks represent 5% and Latinos 2% of new directors in 2016 to 2018. This is very close to the percentages from the three-year period just before. White men have long controlled U.S. corporate boards. Some business leaders argue that it is hard to find qualified candidates of diverse backgrounds. They also say it is difficult at times to know the race or ethnicity of candidates. Now, directors and experts say women are gaining entry partly because of pressure from major investment companies and lawmakers. But also, the experts say, realizing gender diversity is simpler than other diversity. Women are easier to count and make up a larger group to choose, they say. Supporters of greater gender diversity say it can bring better financial results and improve public relations. They also argue that gender diversity is the right move, since women are more than half of the American population. Joe Johnson is a Boston-based partner at the Goodwin Law Firm. He advises corporate boards. They'll move to minorities next, he said, adding that now most big companies are looking for more women. Dominique Miel is a white woman who was named a director of Anworth Mortgage Asset Corporation in November. She said things like the Me Too movement have forced boards to add women so that big investors will continue to support them. If they will say no to your directors, that's a problem, Miel said. A new California law requires that at least three women sit on the boards of state-based publicly traded companies with six or more directors by the end of 2021. At least four other states have passed or are considering similar laws says the National Conference of State Legislatures. While this is good for women, no laws are planned to help minorities. Other countries are more explicit in their demands for diversity, at least when it comes to gender. In Europe, several countries have quotas, including France, which requires 40% of board members at its largest listed companies to be women. In Germany, there is a 30% quota. 
Britain has a government-backed target for women to make up a third of its 350 largest boards by the end of 2020. In the U.S., those who want diverse boards say they help companies deal better with modern issues. Some research shows that gender diversity is linked to better financial results. This may be because those companies are more likely to have engaged employees and lower turnover. But other studies suggest that companies with more women directors perform no differently. The advising company PwC surveyed 714 corporate directors last October. 84% of those questioned said diversity improves board performance, but 52% agreed, at least partly, that board diversity efforts are driven by political correctness. Males represented 80% of the board directors surveyed. Some companies now provide diversity information in documents required by the government. Last year, finance company Regional Management Corp. documented four of its eight directors as white slash Caucasian and four as Hispanic slash Latino. Regional director Roel Campos said investors probably want these details because many of Regional's customers are Latino. He says, we believe that investors are better informed and can judge whether his company's diversity leads to better performance. Luis Aguilar sits on several corporate boards. He says he does not believe arguments that it is hard to find qualified women and minorities to serve on boards. I no longer give much credibility to people saying they can't find who they're looking for because I can quickly find who they're looking for through several organizations, Aguilar said. A Cambodian official reported last week that about 23% of children in three provinces along the border with Thailand have stopped attending school. Cambodian Education Minister Hong Chun Naron spoke at a conference about the student dropout rate. He said that the rate in Batambong, Bante Min Chai, and Udor Minchai provinces was much higher than in other areas, where rates are 18 to 19 percent. The education minister blamed poverty and parents who move to Thailand for work as the main reasons for the problem. Cambodia's education ministry has begun training teachers to advise students to stay in school while letting them choose their own study subjects. Teachers are also to advise students whose parents work overseas about the importance of education. Hong Chun Naron said, So if teachers advise the students to stay in school, that will help them to make the right decision. They could explain to those students that they need to pursue their studies successfully and then find local jobs afterward as well. But critics have expressed concern about the Education Ministry's plan. Ok Chai Wee is president of the Cambodian Independent Teachers Association. She said, the plan fails to deal with the issues that cause students to drop out of school. She says those reasons are poverty resulting from unemployment and a lack of land for farming. She noted that in Cambodia, many students stop going to school 
because they need to work to support their families. Ok Chai Wee said, A better plan would be for the government to try to increase the number of jobs so that citizens could have better living conditions. If the government could give them help, it would still not be enough, she added. Swan Sunwan is a farmer from Bante Minchai. She said that three of her children dropped out of school while they were in the sixth and ninth grades. They went to Thailand to work and help support the family. She said that the children did not want to stop going to school, but had no other choice because of the family's needs. She added, Others who have enough money don't let their children migrate, but me, I am so poor that I had to let them go work in Thailand. Cambodia's Ministry of Labor reports that more than one million Cambodians are working in Thailand. The education minister said that most of them come from provinces along the Thai border. I'm Jonathan Evans. Memory and thinking skills naturally slow with age. Scientists are now looking inside living brains to tell if depression might speed aging. The scientists report that some of the signs they have found are worrisome. Depression has long been linked to some cognitive problems. Depression late in life even may increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Yet how depression might harm the ability to remember things and think clearly is not yet known. One possibility? Brain cells communicate by sending messages across connections called synapses. Generally, good cognition is linked to more and stronger synapses. With a weakening cognitive ability, those connections slowly shrink and die. But until recently, scientists could count synapses only in brain tissue collected after a person dies. Yale University scientists used a new method to study the brains of living people. They discovered that patients with depression had a lower density of synapses than healthy people of the same age. The lower the density, the more severe the signs of depression. Yale University neuroscientist Irina Esterlis says this is especially true of problems with loss of interest in activities patients once enjoyed. She spoke at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Esterlis was not studying just older adults, but people of all ages, including those too young for any cognitive changes to be noticeable. She was working from a theory that early damage can build up. We think depression might be accelerating the normal aging she said. Her studies are small. To prove if depression really does increase the risk of cognitive problems as we age would require more investigation. Hovier Evans is a scientist with the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health. He proposed a study of synaptic density on larger numbers of people as they get older to see if and how it changes over time in those with and without depression. Esterlis has announced plans for a larger study to do that. Volunteers would be injected with a radioactive substance 
that links up to a protein in the vesicles or storage containers used by synapses. Then each volunteer would be given an imaging test known as a PET scan. During the test, areas with synapses light up, enabling researchers to see how many are in different parts of the brain. Esterlis said there are no medications that target synapse damage. Dr. Mary Sano directs the Mount Sinai Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in New York. She was not involved in the new research. Sano warned that normal cognitive aging is a complex process that involves other health problems, such as heart disease. It might be that depression does not worsen synaptic weakening. It could just make the problem more noticeable, she said. With depression, at any age, there's a hit on the brain. At an older age, the hit may be more visible because there may already be some loss, she explained. I'm Ashley Thompson. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In November of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln traveled to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He went there to make a speech at a ceremony establishing a military burial ground. Five months earlier, Confederate General Robert E. Lee had marched his army up from Virginia to invade the North. The Union Army of the Potomac went after him. They met at Gettysburg in the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Kay Gallant and Frank Oliver tell the story of Abraham Lincoln's speech, the Gettysburg Address. The Battle of Gettysburg lasted three days. General Lee threw his men against the Union Army. The Northern soldiers refused to break. Lee, at last, had to stop fighting. Badly hurt, his army went back to Virginia. Lee left behind a battlefield covered with Confederate dead. More than 3,000 Confederate soldiers had been killed. Union losses were almost as heavy. 2,500 Union soldiers had been killed. The terrible job of clearing the battlefield fell to the Union soldiers who had won the battle. Many thousands on both sides had been wounded. The wounded were moved to medical centers for treatment. The dead were buried. Most of the bodies were buried where they fell. The Confederate dead generally were buried together in large, shallow graves. Union troops who fell were buried in separate graves all over the battlefield. A few weeks after the battle, the governor of Pennsylvania visited Gettysburg. As he walked over the battlefield, he saw where rains had washed away the earth, covering many of the fallen soldiers. He said men who died so bravely should have a better resting place than that. The governor said a new cemetery should be built for the bodies of the Union soldiers. He asked the governors of other northern states to help raise money for the cemetery. Within a month, there was money enough to buy a large area of the battlefield for a military cemetery. Work began almost immediately. The human remains were moved from other places on the battlefield and put into graves in the new cemetery. The governor planned 
a ceremony in November 1863 to dedicate the Gettysburg Cemetery. He invited governors and congressmen from each state in the Union. He asked a former senator and governor of Massachusetts, Edward Everett, to give the dedication speech. An invitation was sent to the White House, too. The governor asked President Lincoln to come to the ceremony. He asked Lincoln to say a few words. Lincoln agreed to do so. He felt it was his duty to go. He wanted to honor the brave men who had died at Gettysburg. Lincoln hoped his words might ease the sorrow over the loss of these men and lift the spirit of the nation. Lincoln was advised to talk about democracy. He recently had received a letter from a man in Massachusetts. The man had just returned from a visit to Europe. The man told Lincoln that Europeans saw the war more clearly than Americans who were in the middle of it. He said they saw it as a war between the people and an aristocracy. The South, he said, was ruled by a small group of aristocrats. He said once the people understood that it was a war for democracy, they would win it quickly. The man urged Lincoln to explain to the common people that the war was not the North against the South, but democracy against the enemies of democracy. Lincoln was busy during the two weeks before the ceremony at Gettysburg. He did not have much time to work on his speech. He decided what to say, but he did not choose the exact words he would use. Lincoln left Washington November 18th for the train ride to Gettysburg. The train stopped in Baltimore. A crowd waited to see him. An old man came up and shook Lincoln's hand. He told the president that he had lost a son in the fighting at Gettysburg. Lincoln said he understood the man's sorrow. Lincoln said to the old man, When I think of the sacrifices of life still to be offered and the hearts and homes to be made lonely before this terrible war is over, my heart is like lead. I feel at times like hiding in a deep darkness. Lincoln arrived at Gettysburg at sundown. He had dinner, then he went to his room to complete the speech he would give the next day. He worked for several hours. Finally, it was done. The next morning, Lincoln, on horseback, led a slow parade to the new cemetery. A huge crowd waited before the place where Lincoln and the other important visitors would sit. Military bands played. Soldiers saluted. The ceremonies began with a prayer. Then Edward Everett rose to speak. Everett stood silent for a moment. He looked out across the battlefield and the crowds that now covered it. He began to talk about the Civil War and what had caused it. 
He spoke about Lee's invasion of the North. He told how northern cities would have fallen had Lee not been stopped at Gettysburg. He praised the men who had given their lives in the great battle. Everett spoke for almost two hours. He closed his speech with the hope that the nation would come out of the war with greater unity than ever before. Then Lincoln stood up. He looked out over the valley, then down at the papers in his hand. He began to read. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. But it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. The crowd applauded for several minutes. Then the people began to leave. Lincoln turned to a friend. He said he feared his speech had been a failure. He said he should have prepared it more carefully. Edward Everett did not agree with Lincoln. He said the president's speech was perfect. He said the president had said more in two minutes than he, Everett, had said in two hours. Newspapers and other publications praised Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Said one, the few words of the president were from the heart, to the heart. They cannot be read without emotion. Abraham Lincoln went back to Washington that night. He was very tired. Within a week, his secretary announced that the president was sick. He was suffering from smallpox. And that's our show for today. 
From VOA Learning English, I'm Katie Weaver.